One of the great dangers of the Christian life and in the church today is that of legalism. I don't know if you've ever heard the term legalist or legalism, but legalism is a very dangerous trap that Christians can fall into. It's been defined as a fleshly attitude which conforms to a man-made code for the purpose of exalting self. So legalism is relating to God by law or rules or regulations. And you have your own standards by which you determine who is spiritual and who is not. And it usually leads to self-righteousness and to a censorious, critical, fault-finding, judgmental attitude toward others where you look down at others because they don't pray as much as you, they're not as spiritual as you, they don't read the Bible as much or go to church as much, or they're not doing what you think a Christian should do, therefore you feel superior to them and you want them to keep your rules and your regulations, which aren't biblical, they're just self-established to feed your own flesh. We become self-righteous, we look down on others, we don't meet their, they don't meet our standards, so we lose our sympathy for sinners. We actually start despising those who God loves and for whom Christ died. It's easy after being a Christian for some time to start being isolated and insulated from the world and begin to have a critical judgmental attitude toward those who don't meet our standards or follow the Lord the way we do. So in our text today, Jesus, we find, is calling sinners. He's eating with them and he's reaching out to them. The book of Luke is a book where Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we certainly see that today. And because of this, he is brought to conflict and criticized with the legalist, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. They didn't understand Christ's ministry, his methods, or his motives. And today we're going to learn in our passage Christ's ministry, his message, and his motives, and why he came. We examine this passage, we learn the important distinction between Jesus and religion, and we come to understand why Christians or why Christ came. Now, the key text in not only Luke's gospel, but in our study today, is peek at it, verse 32 in your Bible, verse 32 of chapter 5. Jesus speaking said, I came not to call the righteous to righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus himself is telling us why he came, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now don't misinterpret what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that there are righteous people who don't need me. He's saying these righteous are those self righteous who don't think they need me. They don't see their need for me. So I'm come to call those who are sinners and they know they're sinners. And as we're going to see their need of a doctor, I'm a physician. And he knows that those that are sick are the ones who need the doctor. So I've come to call those who are sinners, not the self-righteous who think they don't need me. Now there's only two main divisions in our text today. And the first one is verse 27 to 30, if you're taking notes. It's the setting for the conflict. So Jesus is now going to come into conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. This is just what's starting to brew in this Gospel of Luke. And we see that the setting is set for him to have the conflict and the criticism. Now, it's so verse 27 to 30. Follow with me in your Bibles. Luke says, After these things, he, that is Jesus, went forth and saw a publican. I'll come back to what a publican is. His name was Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. So Jesus sees Levi at his tax booth, says, follow me. And so he left all, verse 28, rose up and followed him. And Levi made a great feast. I love this, verse 29, in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others, who others would also be considered sinners, that sat down with them. But the scribes and the Pharisees murmured, verse 30, against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? So we see Jesus has a clash with the legalists. Why do you eat and you drink 
with publicans and sinners. I might add, they probably thought, you're going to get cooties if you do that. Sadly, we as Christians can get the same kind of an attitude. No, I don't talk to heathen. I don't talk to sinners. I don't go there. I don't do this. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't hang out with those that do, is your philosophy. I don't go to picture shows. I don't drink. I don't, you know, all your your little standards, which they can be fine, but you need to be careful that you don't become self-righteous and legalistic about it. Now go back with me to verse 27. Let's look at these verses. It took place after these things he went forth. So this is the setting. Now what does he mean by after these things he went forth? After he cleansed the leper, after he healed the paralytic. So he'd been in Peter's house, it's believed. He was in Capernaum. They tore the roof off. They lowered down the lame man, the paralytic. Jesus had healed him by saying, Your sins are forgiven you, right? And then he said, rise up and walk. Now, in the cleansing of the leper and the healing of the paralytic, they were pictures to the miracles of how God saves sinners. He heals us and he cleanses us from our sin. So this is still the context, and it's bringing him into conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees as the tension builds in this gospel. Now, notice it says Jesus saw That word saw in verse 27 is an interesting Greek word. It refers to a contemplative look. It it refers to an observant look. He looked observantly, contemplatively. He didn't just see. He saw intentionally with purpose and observation. So Jesus sees what? He sees a man named Levi who needed salvation. What did Jesus see? Well, he saw a man who was a publican, verse 27. His name was Levi. He was sitting at the receipt of customs. You know that Jesus sees what we do not see. You know you should pray and say, God, give me your eyes. Let me see what you see. Give me your heart. Let me feel what you feel. Give me your compassion. Let me feel your compassion. I love that old song. Let me weep with your tears. Soften my heart. Oh God, soften my heart. Because it's so easy to become calloused toward the sinful world and angry at others. So Jesus saw with purpose and design and intention. And he saw a man who was a publican. Now what is a publican? Verse 27. A publican is simply a tax collector. And I don't want to spend the whole morning talking about tax collectors, but they were Jews. I won't ask anyone to raise their hand either right now. If you're a tax collector, God bless you. We love you. (laughs) Just stay away from me. That's all. I'm just kidding. They were tax collectors. But the problem was they were Jews collecting taxes for Rome. So they were turncoats. They forsaken their own nation. They were Jews working for Gentiles, and they were money-hungry, money-grabbing, and they were actually, they would bid for an area to collect taxes. They would have a custom booth, and as they would have a toll booth, as people came by with their wares and their fish and their lumber and their cloths and their goods, they would look at it and tax them. Now, Rome had set an amount for them to gather and to give it to them, and then they could go beyond that and they put it in their pocket. So they were, they were taxing the people exorbitantly, so they were getting very rich. So a publican was synonymous with wealth, with decadence, with, with, with evil and just licentious greed, and they were hated by Jews. And it's actually said that at this time that tax collectors were the most hated people in society. And literally, when they walked down the street, people would spit at them, throw rocks at them, curse them. They were hated and despised by fellow Jews. And Jesus calls Levi to be his disciple. I can imagine the disciples are thinking, oh, we need to help Jesus here. He's picking the wrong guys. 
He needs to stick with the fishermen, not the tax collectors. So they were probably blown away by Jesus' choice, but we need to see as God sees. We need to feel as God feels. We need to move as God moves toward those who are in need. So whom the world rejected, Jesus now is accepting. And it's interesting in Luke's gospel that we have Levi called to follow Christ, a publican, and we have Zacchaeus in chapter 19, who was the wee little man of Jericho and was a tax collector. And he too was forgiven by Jesus and became one of his followers. Now, Levi was also known as Matthew. And if I interchange those names, please forgive me. But we know him as Matthew, and he's the writer of the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. So this despised, hated, rejected tax collector becomes Matthew, the apostle, the writer of the first gospel in our New Testament. How marvelous that is. And by the way, Matthew, the name means gift of God. So he became a gift of God to us writing his Gospel. Now, he was sitting at a tax booth, probably on a main road. It's believed there was a main road that went from Damascus in the east by the Lake Galilee and then went west to Rome. And so all the goods and the wares that passed through Galilee would actually be taxed by Levi or Matthew at his receipt of customs. Now, Jesus called Levi to do what? Verse 27 and 28, follow me. I thrill, I rejoice. My heart leaps for joy when I hear those words, follow me. What a blessed day it was when Jesus said to you, follow me. Amen? And you turn from your sinful life to follow Jesus Christ. Nothing was ever the same. So in verse 28, he rose up, or excuse me, he left all, he rose up and followed him. He left all, rose up and followed him. What a marvelous thing that is. It's a call for Levi to attach himself permanently to Jesus as his disciples. And again, I wonder, did he know anything about Jesus? I believe he must have. He must have maybe seen some miracles. He must have heard him preach. He must have seen the Lord in the area of Galilee. Maybe he knew about him through James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who he taxed for their fishing business quite often. So he probably had some familiarity with who Jesus was. But what a lesson this is for us. We see God's grace to those the world writes off. You know, when you get to heaven, you're going to be blown away at who you see there. And even more so, people are going to be blown away to see you there. (laughs) They're going to go, what are you doing here? You were messed up, man. And you're just going to say the grace of God, amen? (laughs) Saved by God's grace. People are going to be shocked to see you in heaven. Me too. Amazing. So to see that God accepts and forgives and helps and heals those whom the world rejects. Perhaps the other disciples were upset with the Lord's choice of Levi. Remember, John and James were brothers. Their dad, Zebedee, had a fishing business that was taxed by Levi, now they're in the same group. They're disciples. And he's thinking, this, I don't know about this, Lord. You sure you know what you're doing? He got a tax doctor and a zealot and a bunch of smelly fishermen. Amazing. So God's grace to accept those who the world writes off. Others saw a despised tax collector. Jesus saw a gift of God. And also the cost of Levi leaving, verse 28, says he forsake all. And I I thought that was interesting. I I was reading it this week and many commentaries said, the fishermen could go back to their fishing. But a tax collector could not go back to his job. Because it was so competitive, 
and they would bid it out, and the highest bidder would get it. He couldn't go back to his tax job. So when Levi left, all the money and all the possessions and the things that he possessed, he left everything behind except for one thing. You know what it was? His pen. He closed the books, left his tax booth. He took his pen. Praise God. And he started writing down what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And we have it today. It's called the gospel according to Matthew. So my question is, what's in your hand? Not what's in your wallet. (laughs) What's in your hand? Moses had a rod, and God used that. David had a sling, and God used that. David had a harp, and God used that. What's in your hand? What gift, what ability, what talent has God entrusted to you to use for his glory when he calls you to follow him? What a cost it is to forsake all and follow him. Now, Levi throws a party, and I love this, verse 29. And if anyone could throw a party, let me tell you, a tax collector could throw a party. He had a big house, he had a big crowd, he had all these tax collector friends. Matter of fact, the only friends a tax collector had were tax collectors. No one else would go to his house, except for Jesus. So he takes his disciples, there's all these publicans hanging out. Levi made him, verse 29, a great feast. That means this was a huge bash, big party. In his own house, he had a house and it was a big one. And there was a great company, again, of publicans, tax collectors, and others that sat down with them. So Jesus went to the party. Another observation I've had is that Jesus never turned down an invitation to dinner. (laughs) Neither do I. (laughs) Hey, Jesus, you want to come to our house? I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. Let's eat, let's eat. So Jesus goes to Matthew's house, and there's a big party, but the scribes and the Pharisees, they are not happy. But why did Levi throw the party? Well, to celebrate his new life. Salvation is something worth celebrating, amen? It's more important than your wedding. It's more important than other things in your life, graduation from college. It's celebrating the new life he had in Jesus, and also to honor Christ out of a heart of appreciation to celebrate his new life. And thirdly, to introduce his friends to Jesus. This is number one on this list. I want my publican friends to meet Jesus who changed my life. You know, I've discovered that many times young Christians are the ones that bring unsaved. It's because after you've walked with the Lord for many years, you lose contact with sinners. Did you ever notice that? Now, maybe you have them on the job. Maybe you have them in your neighborhood. Uh, but you, you, you kind of lose contact. You just kind of hang out with Christians, but you lose contact with unbelievers. So my encouragement is if you're a new believer, strike while the, the iron's hot. Before your unsafe friends abandon you or forsake you or won't talk to you, reach out to them. Amen. Remember when I got saved, my friends still come around and then they realize that I'm a Christian. Back then you were a Jesus freak and they didn't want to go around, come around me anymore. So they, we, they, we need to reach out to the people that are around us while we have time to do that. So reach out and share the love of Christ. But notice the criticism and the conflict, verse 30. But the scribes And the Pharisees murmured. They murmured against his disciples. They didn't go directly to Jesus. And they said, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? I want you to note the question mark. There'll be two of them. First question mark. Why do you eat and drink? Now, the Jewish mind, eating with a Gentile meant you become one with them so they wouldn't eat with Gentiles. So for the religious establishment, eating with and drinking with sinners was dangerous because you became one with them, even though that's not what the Bible teaches. So Jesus ate and drank 
with these publicans, just classified as sinners because they were very worldly and ungodly. But Jesus gladly went to the party, but he's brought into conflict. What were the scribes and the Pharisees doing, though, at the party? You ever think about that? We used to say they were sin-sniffing and flesh-finding. I smell a sinner. I smell, I smell a sinner. Ah, oh, there's one right there. Ah, sinner. And when they said, why do you eat and drink with sinners? They probably said, like, sinners. That's the way that sinners. And later on, when Jesus is walking through the wheat fields, they're hiding in the wheat, spying on them. So everywhere they went, they're looking for Jesus to do something they can criticize. This is what a legalist does. They come to the Christian gatherings, they come to Christian fellowship, and they say, why? Look at that. Look at, look at what they're wearing. Look what she's wearing. Look at that. Look at this. And they get critical and fault-finding and judgmental toward it. Why do you eat and drink with these who are sinners? In their view, Jesus and the disciples had defiled themselves by consorting with sinners. They were sadly unaware of the fact that they were sinners themselves in need of God's grace and forgiveness. Someone said religious observance of rites and rituals without love and mercy for needy sinners is a false religion. And we as a church, Revival Christian Fellowship, we can get so comfortable with our Christian friends we get this mentality, us four, no more, shut the door kind of thing. We freak out, like, oh, did you see the way that person came to your dress, come to church? God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at their clothes. Amen? You saw the, maybe the picture of me just a moment ago. When I first got saved, I worked for Campus Crusade for Christ for a few months, and they kept thinking, when's he going to get saved? When's he going to get saved? When they, were, they were praying for my salvation, and I was saved. It's because I had long hair and a beard. I said, I look more like Jesus than you do. <laughs> what are you talking about? So we judge someone by their clothes or the length of the hair back in the 70s rather than looking at their heart. So they become critical of Jesus. They were out of accord with the very heart of God. Think about that. They were out of harmony with the heart of God. May that never be said of us. In history, the, in England, the 18th century church in England became very, very selective on who could come to church. And only the high society, the upper crust, was allowed to come to church. And they actually, the families of wealth, the mobility, nobility, they would buy their own pew. So your family would own your own pew and only you could sit there, and the people of lower class had to enter the church for a separate door and sit in the back of the church on wooden benches with no backs or padding. And so God raised up John Wesley, and he went to the streets, went to the fields, preached to those who needed Christ, and started the Methodist church. Then a hundred years later, when the Methodist church began to be very legalistic and ritualistic, God raised up William Booth, who then started the Salvation Army. And he went right out into the streets, and he kind of blew the doors off the church. He brought street people into the church and stuck them in the pews of the people who, had, who owned the pews and blew the church away. So he had to go outside. He had, as we see, to be new wineskins for the new wine that God was doing, what God was doing at that time. May God help us. Now... Here's the second division of our text, and that is verses 31 to 39. This is the sermon from the conflict. So the setting of the conflict, now the sermon or the message of Jesus that came out of the conflict. So Jesus heals or does some miracle, conflict, and then out of the conflict comes the sermon. Verse 31 to 39. Now, Jesus used the questions from his critics to explain his mission, his methods, and his motives. He does that by giving two pictures 
and the parable. Now, I know this is a lot to cover in one sermon, but I didn't want to break it up in two weeks. Two pictures of why he came, who he is, and a parable, which has two parts as well. First, the two pictures. He is a physician. He comes for those who are sick. Verse 31 to 32. Jesus answering said. Jesus is answering the question in verse 30, now in verse 31. He said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are what? Sick. This is an answer from logic. It's those that are sick that need the doctor. And then he says in verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There it is. I'm the physician. They are sick. It only makes sense that sick people need the doctor, right? So I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus saw Levi and his friends as spiritually sick patients who needed the help of a physician. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were quick to diagnose others, but they were blind to their own sinful condition. Remember the story in Luke chapter 19, or 15, excuse me, of the prodigal son? You're supposed to say yes. Okay, thank you. We'll get there in quite a few months. He wasted his substance on what? Riotous living, reckless, wasteful, sinful behavior. But he repented, saw his need, and came back to the Father. But who else is in the story? The father, and then who? The elder brother. Guess what? That's who the parable's about. The parable's not about the prodigal. The parable's about the elder brother. He's a prodigal too. Because the parable was given because Jesus ate with sinners and hung out with sinners. And Jesus told them, look, when you lose a coin and you find it, you rejoice. When you lose a sheep and you find it, you rejoice. When you lose a son, you find it, you rejoice. So the older brother comes home, and what was going on? A party, right? Music's blaring, everything's happening, people are dancing, eating, having fun. His sinful brother had a new ring on, had a beautiful coat, had brand new sandals on. He'd been working hard out in the field. He'd never forsaken the father. And so he stood outside, wouldn't go into the party, and he got all angry. So the father came out to the older son. And he unloaded on his dad. I've served you. I've done this. You never did this for me. And he just, all, all, the, all the poison in his heart just came pouring out. The father said, son, it's right that we rejoice. Your brother was lost and now he's found. He goes, all that I've had is yours. And it's right that we rejoice, but don't don't have this attitude. You see, there are sins of the flesh, the prodigal younger brother, and there are sins of the spirit, the older brother. You can go to church, you can be religious, you can observe rites and rituals and have a heart that is far from God and God looks at the heart. The proud God knows it far off. So there's sins of the flesh and there's sins of the spirit and we find here that these Pharisees were guilty of sins of the spirit. Their hearts were not right with God. The Lord's answer in verse 31 Makes sense. It's logical. Doctors are for sick people. The Lord's answer was also from Scripture. Write down Matthew 9, verse 13. When Jesus quoted this passage, he said, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Quoting from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus also, and Luke doesn't record it, quoted from Hosea 6.6, 6, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. So that's what Jesus said at that time. Why? Because I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is the great physician. He comes to us in our need. 
He makes a perfect diagnosis and he provides the complete cure the cross. Wouldn't it be great if a doctor came to you? <laughs> Remember when doctors used to come to your house? That's awesome. Now you have to go to their office and wait six hours <laughs> for them to call you in to wait another hour before they come in and take five minutes with you. And then charge you, right? And misdiagnose you, right? I'll stop right there. That's not in the text. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Wouldn't it be cool to have a doctor comes to you, properly diagnoses you, gives you the cure, and doesn't charge you? That's awesome. That's my kind of doctor. So Jesus dies on the cross, pays the penalty for our sin. He knows that we're sin-sick souls, and so he saves us by his grace. How marvelous that is. He is the great physician. Someone said, the first link between my soul and Christ is not my goodness, but my badness. Not my merit, but my misery. Not my standing, but my falling. Not my riches, but my poverty. I love that. So you come naked, poor, wretched, blind. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They need the physician. The second picture is Jesus said, I'm a, I'm a bridegroom. It's a wedding. We celebrate. Notice verse 33 and 35. Jesus says, they, he said unto them, why? They said unto him, excuse me, why did the disciples of John, this is John the Baptist, they, they, they fast all the time. They make prayers. And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, they, they, they fast and pray. But yours, they eat and drink. They were, they, 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 they're having too much fun. You're not supposed to have fun. You're not supposed to eat and drink. And he said to them, verse 34, can you make the children of the bride chamber? Now, this is actually bridegroom. This is the image of a wedding feast. Can you make the children of the bridegroom at a wedding feast fast while the bridegroom is with him? No. But the days will come, verse 35, when the bridegroom, referring to Christ, shall be taken away from them. That's his death and burial. Then shall they fast in those days. Now, again, I, I, perhaps I should have taken two weeks on these texts. So Jesus is the physician. We're sick, and he comes to heal us. Jesus is the bridegroom. We're at a wedding. What do we do at a wedding? We eat, right? Praise God. We celebrate, right? Would you go to a wedding all bummed out? This is really a bummer. They're getting married. I can't believe they're having a reception. Free food, dancing, celebrating, fun. Ah, bah humbug. Slap the dude. It's a wedding. Lighten up. People come to church. You laugh. You smile. I can't tell you over the years how many times I've been criticized for using humor in sermons. I had a woman come up to me one time. She was just full on angry with me. You crack jokes while you preach. I said, if you know what I held back, you'd give me credit. <laughs> you think I think that's bad? I'm holding back, lady. <laughs> well, Christians aren't supposed to have fun. She thought that we were to be baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> Wipe the smile off your face. You're in church right now, you know. Don't, don't laugh. God, God frowns on that. No, 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 no. That's insane. The Christian life is not a funeral fast. It's a wedding feast. Amen? Amen. Now, fasting's fine. If you want to fast, fast. You know that the New Testament, I, I had a lot of questions about this after first service. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to fast. Fasting's mentioned. It's assumed we will, but we're not commanded. There's no imperatives. And in the Old Testament book of Leviticus 16, there's only one day a year the Jews were commanded to fast, and that's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So they had all these days of fast. The Pharisees fasted twice a week. 
They gave tithes of all they possessed. And they thought, whoo, I'm spiritual. Look at how spiritual I am. How often do you fast? And they thought they were better than others. So don't take what is not a required law in the Bible and foster it on someone else because they don't keep your standard. You think you're more spiritual because you fast? Not necessarily so. And Jesus said, when you do fast, don't, don't let your face look sad. Wash your face, comb your hair. And I would add, don't go to a Christian potluck. <laughs> Walk around looking at the food, smelling it. Oh, you're going to eat? No, I'm fasting. <laughs> Whew, well, I'm not. Get out of the way. I want the mashed potatoes. <laughs> That's the way I feel when I'm in a potluck. Just get out of the way. I'm, I'm headed for those mashed potatoes. Now, fasting is a legitimate discipline, but it has to be led of the Spirit. It has to be because you're earnest before God. It doesn't win you brownie points with God. And it doesn't obligate God to do what you want Him to do. That, that can never happen. It's the denial of the flesh to strengthen your spiritual life. And there's benefit and value. But I've, I've never really been able to fast. When I fast, I get visions, but they're not from God. Flying hamburgers, <laughs> French flies in the sky. But they, they, just, they just basically got upset because you, you guys, you can't, you're, Jesus, you and disciples are having fun. Now you can't do that. Here's the problem in the church. Those with less liberty become critical of those with greater liberty. I heard of a pastor, this true story, back east, who had a very legalistic church. They viewed Sunday as the Sabbath, and you can't have fun. And it was a real cold winter day, and every, all the streets ice up, and there was a snowstorm, and he had to put on ice skates and skate to church. But when his elders found out, they were upset. You can't skate on Sabbath. So they called him after the service. They said, Did you, we heard you skated to church today. He said, yeah. It's the only way I could get to the church service. And say, well... I guess that's okay, as long as you didn't enjoy it. <laughs> said, no, I was miserable the whole way. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of times people are today. No joy in the Christian life. Third thing Jesus did was give them a parable. And there were two pictures. One about a new patch on an old garment. One about new wine and old wineskins, verse 36 to 39. Let's read it. So he spake also a parable unto them. No man put us a piece of new garment on an old. Got a new piece of cloth, put on an old tear on an old garment. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. No man puts new wine, verse 37, into old bottles, or actually wine skins, else the new wine bursts the bottles, and it spills, and the wine skins will perish. New wine, which is what Jesus was bringing, must be put in new wine skins, not the old wine skins of Jewish legalism. And both are preserved. No man having drunk the old, Jesus is indicting the scribes and Pharisees, no man having drunk the old wine straightway desireth the new, for he says, the old is better. So they cater to their religious rites and rituals. We don't want the new wine of God's grace. Now, what's this new patch on an old garment? What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you have an old piece of clothing and there's a tear and you're going to take a patch, if the patch is off a new piece of cloth and you sew it to the old, when you wash it, the new will shrink, the old has already shrank, and it will tear the old garment, so both are destroyed. So the new patch must be put on new cloth so that both are preserved. Jesus did not come to patch up the old, he came to give us the new. He didn't come to reform Judaism and make us legalistic, he came to bring in the new covenant of grace. What about the new wine and the old wine skin? Now, they didn't have bottles. They didn't have glass. 
And they didn't have thermoses like we had today. So they would take a goat, they would kill the goat, skin the goat, and the goat would become a skin for wine. It would be a wine skin out of leather. And the wine would ferment and it would flex and grow and stretch. There was elasticity in the leather. But once it became old, it became brittle and hard. If you then poured new wine, unfermented wine, into the old wine skin, and the fermentation would start to have the gases, it would expand, it would burst the wine skin. The goat skin would burst. So new wine must be put in new wine skin. So Jesus didn't come to patch up Judaism. He didn't come to pour new wine into old wine skins. We must have new wine skins. So Judaism is going away. Christianity is coming in. Remember when Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom? God was saying something to us. The way is made now by grace. The entire book of Hebrews is about this. Jesus is a better priest. He has a better covenant. He has a better temple. He's better than angels. He's better than the old. But anyone who's drank the old, the rites and the rituals says, I don't really want the new because they're self-righteous and don't see their need of God. Someone said like this, men are often more impressed with the antiquity of a religious practice than with its validity. They're more impressed with the antiquity of a religious practice than they are with its validity. Now, Jesus came, verse 32, to call sinners to repentance. He came to heal our sin-sick souls. He came to bring us joy and liberty where he sets us free. And he came to bring us new life. When Nicodemus, who was a religious Jew, came to Jesus in John 3, what did Jesus say? You must be what? Born again. It's not that they didn't need the physician. It's that they didn't realize that I'm sick. So what a blessing when God allows you to see your sin-sick soul. And you cry out to him for forgiveness. And you experience the joy of sins forgiven. But we also learn, my dearly beloved, from the story, don't be afraid to have contact with sinners. Don't be, able to, don't be afraid to go to your heathen neighbor's house and have dinner with them or have them in your home. Share the love of Christ. Amen? 